Thank you very much, Mario, and um, to the whole team for having us here and, and part of this fantastic conference. Um, it's great for me to be presenting alongside um, Andrea Moser and Joanne Kemp from the La Trobe Sport and Exercise Medicine Research Centre and presenting to you some of the work we're doing, some of the research we're doing um, around women in sport and also women in sport and exercise physiotherapy. Um, I receive money from government and non-government organisations, also from industry, from Levin Health, non-for-profit courses that we run, and I'm on the editorial board of British Journal of Sports Medicine. And my biases are that I love sport and physiotherapy and everything that really keeps women active over their lifespan. Um, on behalf of Andrew and Joe and myself, we'd like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of the of country throughout Australia and their connections to land, sea and community, and we pay our respects to their elders past, present and emerging. So one of the things we're really passionate about is having women being able to work within elite sport with the equal opportunities as men and also to be able to work in a respectful environment. But at the moment, this isn't always the case. And so we're, we're currently undertaking a research program which we're calling Changing Culture to promote female sport and exercise practitioners working in elite sport. And the first thing we need to do is to describe the culture. So we're running a survey of Australian Physiotherapy Association sport and exercise physiotherapists. And we're asking them about their experiences of working in or trying to work in elite sport. And the topics that we're including in the survey include unconscious biases, processes, mentoring and safety for themselves and for those that they care for. Once we have the results of this survey, we're then going to be running interviews um, with the women working in elite sport. And our, our intent is not just to describe the culture, but to try and come up with some solutions that we can apply within the Australian setting and that could possibly apply to other countries as well. We also know that there's a paucity of research by women and about women in sports science, and we want to shine the light on women working in sport and exercise physiotherapy. And so we're running a study that's been led by Sally Cowan, where we're reviewing the publications, so original studies, systematic reviews, editorials and opinion pieces in four of the leading journals. And we're going to describe and compare the sex and gender distributions of authors and of participants. And we're going to compare that over the last three years with the decade earlier. So similar to our other study, we also want to come up with some solutions. So if we need to increase the proportion of, of publications by women and about women, what are we going to do about that? So that's a watch this space to see where we go and a place where we're hoping to collaborate with others around the world. Lastly, in this space, we're looking at the recording and reporting of injury and illness in sport, and many people will be aware of the IOC consensus on this. It was published not that long ago. But for anyone trying to work with female athletes or in the women in sports space, we know that there actually is a lack of um, information for people to apply to the, to the female athlete. And so we're working on an extension with Izzy Moore from Cardiff and Evert Verhagen from the Netherlands to focus on the new, unique female health considerations that can influence sports participation and could confound injury and illness outcomes. So looking at menstrual and gynecological health, everything from preconception all the way through to returning to sport postpartum, menopause, and then some of the more social elements around parenting and caregiving and the gendered environment. So trying to come up with a solution for women, for people who are working with, with female athletes and women in sport to be able to more accurately reflect um, their injury and illness burden and the relationship with the female um, health considerations. When we think about our research into women in sport, one of our big focuses on, is on trying to reduce the knee injury burden. Um, I think everyone in the room knows that women are much more likely than men to sustain an anterior cruciate ligament or ACL tear. But a couple of years ago in Australia, they decided that women sh should and could be able to start playing Australian football. So for many years, women couldn't play it or weren't allowed to play it. And when they introduced the women's game, 
we sort of knew it'd be problematic. Um, they, there's a lot of running, there's a lot of twisting and turning, there's a lot of aerial work that they do a lot of jumping and landing. They tackle when they they are tackled. It's a it's a full contact sport. And over the first few years, we've seen that women are between six and nearly ten times more likely to tear an ACL playing Australian football than men. And the other thing is that we know there are programs out there that can reduce injuries. There are, there are randomised controls, trials and systematic reviews showing that we can reduce injuries by up to 50%. Um, but we don't really know about women who are playing Australian football. We haven't really, we haven't had any studies at all in this space. So we devised a program called prep to play which I'll tell you about, and we're actually now running a large study trying to implement this injury prevention program into community football. We need this project because even though there are programs out there that can reduce injuries, we know that people don't do it. And when our first lot of work in this space, we try to find out why, and basically because there was nothing that was actually designed specifically for the women playing Australian football. So we got together with the women playing football, with all the other code, with all the other stakeholders and end users. We went to the experts and we went to the evidence and we used a three-step approach to develop a program to be used in the elite program, which is called AFLW in Australia. And that program was called Prep to Play. We then adapted Prep to Play to the community program using a four-step process and we evaluated the initial um, uptake of that using REAIM. So in Prep to Play, we have four main components, an education component, a dynamic warm-up, strengthening exercises, and Australian football specific skills. And right now, everyone can access these. So all the coaches can access all of the, all of the resources they need to deliver these different components to the players. We worked with the Australian Football League to co-design um, brochures, um, manuals and even videos that all of the coaches can access um, right now. So in our study, we're comparing this, which we're calling unsupported. So it's the available access to all of this information right now to a supported implementation where we actually deliver workshops to coaches. So we train physios how to deliver the workshops. We provide them with additional materials. And then after they've gone through the workshop, we send the physios down to the club to actually watch them uh, deliver the program and give them feedback. And then we have some optional ongoing peer and expert support. So the primary aim of this study is to compare the impact of this supported implementation with the unsupported implementation um, on the use of prep to play in community football. Our secondary aims are to see whether the supported implementation of prep to play will reduce injuries, in particular ACLs, identify barriers and enablers to the sustainability of prep to play, and evaluate its cost effectiveness. We aim, it's a large study, we aim to recruit 2,600 female football players, approximately 140 teams that are in 10 different clusters. So each cluster has about 14 teams and they're a mixture of metropolitan Melbourne and also regional Victoria. As I said, the control for this is actually the resources that already exist. And then at some point during a two year period, it goes over two seasons, um, each of the clubs and the teams go through the supported implementation. We've trained 60 prep to play physios and these are the physios who train the coaches. Our primary outcome is use of prep to play. So each team has a representative that records the use of prep to play. But in addition, we have blinded observers who go to each club at least five times during the two year period and observe either training or and or games. For our secondary injuries, we're mostly focusing on ACL, but we're also interested in concussion and Andrew's gonna talk about that. We record injuries through sports trainers who are affiliated with each team. And then we also get direct information from the player via an SMS. And we're doing program evaluation through interviews and focus groups and surveys, and they will start soon. And we're evaluating the health economics of this program. So we're using a stepped wedge cluster randomised control trial over two football seasons, so 2021 and 2022. Each of the clusters, so each of those has the 14 or so teams in it, starts off in the unsupported, which is the dark orange in this case, 
They then at different stages over the two years go through the transition where we do the training and we do the visits to the clubs. And then they're considered to be in the supporter, which is the light orange. So in effect, each team is compared to itself. Um, we received the funding in 2020 to do um, the study. We started our planning then. Um, we commenced our injury surveillance this year. Our football season starts in April. We commenced our first implementation in June and we're planning to repeat that next year and finish the study by the end of the year. But as many of you will know, Melbourne has had the longest and the hardest lockdown of I think anyone in the world and we've had three COVID interruptions to the season and so we're about a third down in terms of, of what we've been able to collect data on so we're going to have to make up a little bit of time next year. So thank you for listening, watch this space, we're very excited about this big study we've got going and um, hopefully we'll have some results for you in the next couple of years and I'd like to hand over to Andrea. Thank you very much Kate. I'll just have to share my screen. Okay, everyone see the slides there? Great, so as Kay mentioned, I'm gonna be talking about concussion in the female athlete. And just as Kay mentioned, I do have some disclosures, particularly some funding disclosures, some work with journals and the same biases that Kay has. But I also just added one extra bias, and that is I'm pretty obsessed with prevention, and uh, particularly in the area of uh, high burden, such as concussion. So Latham, Latrobe, we're not really well known for our concussion research. So why are we suddenly entering this uh, minefield of, a, of an area of research? Well, there has been some really uh, prominent headlines in the news about concussion in female athletes. Um, we know that there is a risk, a higher risk in female soccer players. Um, there was a really strong lobby against the um, Australian Football League to modify the rules for the women's league so that players are better protected. And there was huge concerns for particularly concussion and knee injuries in our female um, elite football players. And then unfortunately, we had this terrible circumstance in 2018 where a very talented Indigenous player whose brother happens to be um, a professional AFL player who died after a, suffering a head injury during the Women's um, League Grand Final. So this really created a, an urgency to look at investigating some of the causes of concussion for the female athlete and urgently um, develop some resources to prevent concussion. So what is the burden of concussion? We know that there's growing evidence, although it is conflicting uh, depending on the sport and depending on the research of a higher incidence of concussion in female athletes. We certainly know that in the elite Australian football, the incidence in women is much higher than that of men. So that's very clear. We also know that female soccer players have worse initial symptom scores, severity scores on assessment of concussion, and they appear to have a prolonged return to play time. So it may be that um, female athletes are, um, have greater burden of concussion than male athletes. And as uh, Kay mentioned, we have this fantastic opportunity in this large scale cluster randomized controlled trial, which is being led by the brilliant um, Brooke Patterson. And here we are collecting some injury and exposure data and particularly focusing on serious knee injuries and head injuries. And we've used a broad definition of, in, of head injury, we wanted to cast the net really wide. And our definition is any injury to the head region which occurs during a football match or training, regardless of whether there's time loss resulting from that injury. And then we do some follow-up um, phone calls and clinical diagnosis to uh, classify as concussion or a head knock, which is a head injury, which is not a clinical diagnosis of concussion. Now we have some preliminary data, as Kay mentioned, this year was affected by COVID. We only had 10 official matches, but even in those 10 official matches, we had 424 reports of head knocks. And of those 35% had a clinical diagnosis of concussion. And this actually means that of the 2,600 players we have recruited, 5.6 of them sustained a concussion in 2021. So 
this is community level football and it seriously is a problem. So we have some program elements within Prep to Play which are specifically targeting prevention of concussion. We know that 70 to 80% of them occur during tackling, ground balls or aerial contests. So we have some football specific skills built into the program to try to uh, protect the head with these injury mechanisms. And we will have some effectiveness data from this implementation project to present to you in 2023 and hopefully it's exciting data. Now the other area of concussion which we're entering into is looking at assessment and monitoring using eye tracking technology, so the Neuraline goggles. And using these goggles we are assessing ocular motor impairments but a lot of the neural pathways are involved in ocular motion such as the cerebrum, brainstem and cerebellum. So this also by proxy uh, assesses these neural pathways. We have a reliability study currently underway, which is looking great. And in 2022, we have a plan to test our female community football players with these goggles, um, these eye tracking technology, to look at whether it can differentiate between those with a history of concussion versus no history, um, examining the relationship of this ocular motor motion with clinical signs of recovery, and see if it can detect the relationship with severity of concussion symptoms immediately post injury. And we're hoping to repeat this in the elite female football players and be able to compare these two populations. Now, the other thing we're doing, we, we are lucky enough to have um, Associate Professor Michael McDesey as part of LASM, and he's a member of the Concussion in Sport Research Group. And he's been presenting a number of uh, seminars and, present and lectures to our Prep to Play physios, but also as part of our Return to Sport um, Symposium. We had a panel discussion in June 2021 where we had some international and local Australasian researchers um, do some recorded presentations and online panel discussion, which was very well um, received. And we are also planning some face-to-face -face presentations and workshops next February where we have Catherine Schneider and Trudy Rebeck um, discussing concussion assessment, management and prevention specifically for the sports physio. And we're also going to work on developing our education resources to emphasise prevention of concussion in the female athlete. So watch this space. There could be some exciting things coming from LASM in the concussion field. Thank you. I'll hand over to Associate Professor Joanne Kemp. Thanks very much, Andrea, and thank you, Kay. Really great presentations on um, the work we're doing in knee injuries and in concussion, and I think really, really importantly in promoting um, women in sport in, as, as clinicians and researchers as well as athletes. So I'm just going to um, share my screen, and what I'm going to present to you today is I share my screen. And can... Um, Everyone see my slides, okay? So I'm going to talk about women in sport and particularly looking at the burden of hip pain in women across the lifespan. And um, as Kay and Andrea mentioned, I also have some financial disclosures. So I'm an editor of BJSM, where I receive a small fee. Um, I have some industry sponsorship, and I'm also the lead of the Glad Australia program, which is a not-for-profit program that um, generates income from training physiotherapists. But I think my big disclosure is that I um, play sport myself. I'm a woman, I play sport, and I have a teenage daughter who really loves her sport. And so I'm really passionate about enabling these amazing, healthy and fit, strong young women Women to continue to play sport across their lifespan um, for as long as they can being um, unimpeded by injuries and illness. So um, as Kay mentioned, one of our main goals at LASM is to really try and encourage women to be healthy and active right across their lifespan. But the problem that we have um, in terms of hip pain is that women actually suffer a disproportionate burden of hip pain um, across their lifespan. And so what I'd like to do is just really, really briefly describe the burden of hip pain across women's lifespan and then tell you about some of the projects that we're doing to try and address that. 
So we um, were very fortunate to be in Switzerland three years ago now presenting in Bern at the, um, at the Sports Medicine Conference. And then we all went to Zurich where we were able to take part in the, um, the first consensus meeting for the International Hip Related Pain Research Network. And from that, um, from that meeting, we came up with some consensus recommendations on the classification of hip pain in younger adults. And what the consensus was, was that hip pain in younger adults can be classified as either femoroacetabular impingement syndrome, acetabular dysplasia or hip instability, or other pathology such as labral and chondral pathology, where we don't see the changes in bony morphology that you see in both femoroacetabular impingement syndrome and acetabular dysplasia. And so let's have a look at those um, classifications of hip pain and look at what the burden of hip pain is across women's lifespan um, as women progress from, from being younger women into middle-aged women and into older women. Now, I think it's really important to note that women are, are really, really active at all stages of their lifespan. So younger women are students, they're busy with their studies at school and university. They're often having part-time jobs as well. They like to play a lot of sport and they're also really, really socially active. Um, once women go into their 20s and 30s, they're professional, um, they're professional women, they may be starting to juggle families, they're still playing a lot of sport, and, um, and also really, really busy socially. And then as they move into their 30s and 40s, this is often the age that women might have family responsibilities. So again, they're juggling work, they're juggling family responsibilities, looking after young children, um, and still trying to keep active and trying to keep keep fit. And then as women get older, again, they still have these, this, this large burden of caring, of, of caring for grandchildren, of caring perhaps for older parents. Um, they may still be working. And so they really, really, really are busy. And so they need to be able to, to, to fulfill all of their, um, the different roles that they play in life. They really need to be able to be fit and active and not impeded by hip pain. And if we think about hip pain at these time points, in younger women, this is where we tend to see acetabular dysplasia and hip instability, so that classification of hip pain. And if we look at the burden of women, what we know is that 80% of these people who suffer from acetabular dysplasia are women. And we also know that one third of those people will progress to hip replacement within 10 years of their diagnosis as a young adult. A little bit later on that timeline, this is when people tend to present with femoroacetabular impingement syndrome. And what we know is that 50% of these people are women. So in, you know, in contrast to what we often hear that it's a young athletic man, male disease, 50% of people with femoroacetabular impingement syndrome are women. And these women in their late twenties have pain and quality of life scores that are similar to women who have end stage hip osteoarthritis. So it really does burden them at that time of life when they're really, really active. Once they move a little bit um, into, into their 30s and 40s, this is when we tend to see the chondral and labral pathology that we could probably call early hip osteoarthritis. And what we know is that 50% of these people are women. And if early um, OA is present, then these women, if they go to arthroscopy, are four times more likely to progress to hip replacement within two years. And then lastly, hip, hip osteoarthritis is 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 what women in their older, middle age and older age tend to present with. And with the burden of hip osteoarthritis is such that 30% more women than men will have hip osteoarthritis and 30% more women than men will end up having a hip replacement. So we can see that the burden of hip pain affects women right across their lifespan and it is disproportionately high. So what are we doing at LASM to try and address that burden? How can we reduce the burden of hip pain over, the, over women's lifespan? So I think there's a couple of different things that we need to do. We need to understand the natural history of hip pain at, at key time points across a women's lifespan and at these time points where we could potentially alter that trajectory. And we can do that with cohort studies. And then we also need to develop interventions that can effectively reduce the burden at various stages of, of women's life cycle. And this is where our clinical trials and implementation projects um, come into play. And so if we firstly look at the studies that we are doing at LASM to try and so the cohort studies that are try and, um, trying to detect hip pain early um, and establish the natural trajectory, 
We have a study called the Femoroacetabular Impingement Osteoarthritis Cohort Study or Project Force. This is a really large cohort study of which um, Professor Crosley is the chief investigator. In this study, we've recruited almost 200 men and women um, and also a control cohort. So the men and women are footballers um, who have hip and groin pain. And we're following them over two years and then eventually five years to look at baseline factors that predict a structural change in, in their hip joint. So predict the onset of osteoarthritis in these men and women. So looking at factors such as muscle strength, such as biomechanics, um, other social and, and psychological factors that can potentially um, be related to that progression down the line um, you know, down the path of hip osteoarthritis. We also have a new study that we are planning, which is um, which is currently a small study that a PhD student is doing, Michael O'Brien, but we're planning to expand, which is the periacetabular osteotomy for hip dysplasia cohort. So in this cohort study, again, we're going to take um, boys and girls, men and women at a very young age and watch their trajectory as they have treatment for their hip dysplasia, again, to try and determine factors that will predict who goes down that pathway of osteoarthritis. And then our treatment studies are our clinical trials that we're doing. We have a study called the Physio First Study, which is a study that's comparing two exercise interventions for men and women with ephemeroacetabular impingement. We also have a, an RCT that we're about to start, which is looking at the effectiveness of medicinal cannabis to treat um, hip and knee pain in, in young and middle-aged adults. And lastly, we have the GLAD Australia program, which is an implementation program um, to treat hip and knee osteoarthritis in older men and women. So I'd just like to say a big thanks. We have a really, really large team of fabulous researchers who are working on our hip pain project. So I'd really, really like to thank um, this amazing team of researchers that we have at La Trobe University. And I'd like to um, thanks again to Mario and the committee for the invitation. And I'd really, really, I just really commend you on looking at women in sport because it's such an important, an important topic. And I think it's going to be a fantastic meeting. So thank you very much. Many thanks, Kai, uh, Andrea, and uh, Joe, for uh, really a uh, very nice and I would say impressive overview of your uh, activities, research, and more. Uh, maybe just to um, just to have an idea to our uh, viewers, some how many people are involved if you at your centres. Yeah, that's a really good question. I should know the answer really easily. Um, we have about 12 or 13 postdoctoral researchers, Mario. So it's, it's a really big team. And then about 30 or so PhD candidates. Um, so each of those projects, obviously the HIP project Joe outlined, uh, Prep to Play has about 10 people working on it. Um, and um, we have another big project, uh, Mario, looking at rehabilitation after ACL, and it probably has another five or six people. And then there's obviously the work that Jill's doing and, and a few other people as well. So we are a big team. We do have some people that work on multiple projects, but we are a big team of people. We're mostly happy. Excellent. And uh, uh, maybe just a few words with uh, Andrea and Joe. So... Do you see in uh, coming to Australian rule football, women's league, uh, concussion rates are, are similar than men or higher in, in female? Yeah, no, in the first uh, few years, we only have data from, I think, the first four seasons, mm. Mario, and it's about one and a half times mm. the incidence rate of concussion in the elite female football mm. players compared to the males. And that is higher. So the male elite is higher than male community, but we actually don't know the, the incidence rate in female community players. So that's what we'll hope to be able to determine from the Prep to Play project. Yes, and then maybe similar for Joe, what about the FIES in women's um, players versus men players? You have some- Yeah, uh, it's a good- it's a good question. So we actually don't have that data from the women, so from the Australian Football League for Women. But if we look across the, the various studies, it, it really, I think, traditionally has been considered to be 
um, uh, a problem that's predominantly for younger male athletes. But what we're starting to see is that women are probably presenting a little bit later than men. So men tend to often present in their, in their you know, around the age of 20, in their early to mid 20s. Um, what we've seen in our studies is that um, women are presenting and seeking treatment in their late 20s and into their 30s. So in our large clinical trial um, of active women, we, we had we have slightly more women than men in that cohort and their average age is in their mid to late 30s. So it's at that time point where women are trying to juggle all of those different responsibilities that they have, um, that they're presenting with, with the typical signs of, of femoroacetabular impingement syndrome, where they have that the bump of bone, the morphology, and the symptoms and signs associated with it. So I think it's more, it is more common in women than what we have previously thought. They do present later for treatment as well. Many thanks. I think we could go on for a long time discussing, but uh, as you know, we are at the Swiss conference. We have to stick really <laughs> to the time schedule. So, but uh, I mean, uh, for sure, people they can catch you um, on many on many sites, and then of course PubMed, all what you have done and you are doing. So, yeah. thanks a lot, and on your website and thank social, you. of course. So I thank yes. you a lot for your contribution. It was wonderful. And I wish you all the best, and hopefully we can we see us soon somewhere. Thank you. Okay. Ciao, Good ciao. Night, everyone. Ciao, ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. Ciao. Bye. ciao. Bye. ciao. Bye. ciao.